Hello, hello, Land Flipping 101 community. Today we're going to peek inside my business and look at my closings for this past month. Hi, I'm Chris Thomas and this is Land Flipping 101 and I help real estate investors achieve financial freedom with a plug and play A to Z blueprint for flipping land without funding their own deals using my personal land flipping secrets. I show investors the exact steps I've taken to find financial freedom and earn an average of $35,000 per deal in land flipping. But I have a very specific target goal. I am hyper focused on just one business model of land investing and there are many ways to earn money in real estate and in the land niche at that and I've picked just one. Okay, that's right. I'm not going after a $500 purchase price and selling it for $4,000. I don't get excited about those margins. I'm not selling on payments or, or self-closing anything so I can save $1,000. <laughs> I am going to target higher profit deals. It's less work. I can rely on professionals to help me close it and do it by the book um, so I'm legal. And today, I'm going to just give you a peek inside my business for January. But first, a question. Linford, I see your question. How's the competition in land? Y'all, land is not as competitive as houses. I'd say it's one-tenth. In fact, um, you know, sending out direct mail campaigns used to be the way they did it in the land or the housing business and it quit working because it was so competitive. In land, you can still do it and it works great. That's my, my primary marketing method. Okay, let's see. Hi, Keisha, Thomas, hello. Um, I had a question in the group this week from Rodolfo Mendoza. He said, when you get an offer accepted, do you guys go ahead and do surveys to know where the landlines are? Or what do you guys do? Well, the first thing I'm going to mention is a app that I like to give people. It's called Land Glide. Like if they're out looking at the property, they can put uh, the app on their device and look at their device walking around. They can see where the property lines are. Okay. I do give that out as a tip to people. But in this question, the first thing I do when I get a, a property under contract is really two things simultaneously. I file an affidavit with the county to put the public on notice, you know, that I have an interest in this property now. And I also send it to the title company for a preliminary report. So they'll often be able to tell me if it's a go or no go <laughs> for marketing purposes. And as far as getting a survey, you know, I don't typically do one you know, only if title would require it to close or if there's an access issue, like you can't legally uh, get to the property. But even then, I'll try to get the seller to pay for it, or at least half. <laughs> and, or I've, I have done it where I've gotten the seller to pay half and the buyer to pay half and then I'm not paying anything. Um, but sometimes the bank wants one and in that case, I would ask the buyer to pay for it. Or worst case, I'll split the survey. But Usually I would pay the second half at closing. Great question. All right, today I'm gonna to give you my January 2022 gross profit estimate. But this is to show you what this is all about, okay? So first, I had two 12-acre properties side by side. By the way, um, spoiler alert, I had four closings. I have four closings this month. <laughs> All right, so the first one is two 12-acre properties side by side, and they had a major waterway running through it. So the, the property lines were just constantly moving, but it was a beautiful property in a very popular area. I got it under contract for $115,000 and the sale price was $190,000. It took about six months to sell and close. And you may be wondering, how in the world did I fund this one? I mean, this, this actually was one of my, my favorite deals ever because this was a double closing where I brought two contracts to title and they used the end buyer's funds to pay 
pay the seller and sent me the proceeds. I posted about it earlier this month when it happened. All right, the second one I was seven acres in a floodway behind two neighborhoods and a church. <laughs> the land was donated to the church as an inheritance, and there was no legal easement, although, you know, there was an obvious uh, but unfinished physical roadway to the property. It just wasn't a legal roadway. In other words, it wasn't recorded in any documents of any deeds nearby, and the buyer wanted to develop the land, but the title company wasn't going to ensure access. That's what they were telling the seller, which was um, the church. And this, the lender then also required the buyer to get a survey. So I did agree to split the cost with him. He paid the first half, and I paid my half at closing. But in this state, I had to pay for the land up front and get it recorded before I could close with the end buyer. So I needed transactional funding, and I used my credit line to close on a Friday with the seller, which was, which was the church, and then uh, title had to record it. So before I was going to close on that and take title, I had to get the buyer to sign off that he understood it would not be insured for access by the title company. And I wanted that in writing because I was worried. So this this one took a few months to close um, after I found the buyer uh, because the lender, you know, anytime a lender gets involved, they want to appraise it, survey it, and you know, of course, ensure they will get their repayment. So I consider this a success story, even though I only made 21,000 on this one, which still hit my target goal criteria, but it was kind of a near miss. I, I think this one took me almost a year to close. Wow, I hate that. Uh, the third one, though, it was a 20-acre property inside the city limits, which had never been developed. It was donated to a nonprofit healthcare services company, and you know they didn't know what to do with it, and they didn't care or want it, so they were thrilled to get my letter. And um, there were some challenges with the topography of the land, but there were three different sides of the property where streets dead ended into the property. And so even though this one took almost eight months to close, because <laughs> once we had the buyer and set the closing date, the board of the nonprofit had to vote on it at their monthly meeting. So that property produced a gross profit of about $51,000. Altogether, for January, those three estimate, uh, they're estimated to be around $138,000 in profit. And there is still, I said there were four, there is still one more possibility for this month. It's supposed to schedule, or it's scheduled for Monday, but I'm realizing it may not go through now. I'm a little worried about it. You know, a lot of deals do fall away for various reasons, and you know, we're just, I'm playing a numbers game here. This, <laughs> this one has a seller who's ghosting me. So I have a signed purchase agreement to buy the property and in fact it doesn't expire for a few more months <laughs> but it was in such a great area I was able to uh, get a buyer and uh, when we set the closing date for January 31st I reached out and so did title to the seller and they are he is not responding so I don't know what is going on so yesterday what did I do in this situation yesterday I sent a strongly worded letter to the seller and I'm hoping that that, along with my prayer, <laughs> should get me to closing on Monday, but we'll see. But if it does close, that would add another $35,609 for a total profit in January, potentially, of $173,753 and some change. <laughs> That's four closings in January. How in the world did I do this? Well, it's actually more simple than you think. Um, I decided. I got a partner, and we together decided what we wanted, and we put a number to it. So I reverse engineered my goals. I began with the end result that I wanted to achieve, and then figured out, you know, how many mailers I needed to, to get those results. And then I created a system to handle all of the tasks associated with flipping the land and just kept cranking it. Eventually, I started having closings every month and big deals started coming in like you've seen for this month. 
Hey, Jimmy. Hey, Terry. Hi, Nicholas. Hi, Elizabeth. Y'all, the key to my success has been consistent daily action. And I keep saying that. It's, but it's consistency and it's daily. I just set up my system and it worked every week consistently. And eventually it started paying off. And I just can't keep, um, you know, emphasizing enough consistency. Know where you want to go, set a plan, and set sail. <laughs> and y'all, this is a great time to be getting into land flipping because with the limited housing supply and the increased demand, and also with people having sort of redefined what home means after COVID came on the scene, <laughs> people are migrating out of town or to a new state with a better tax situation. You know, people don't have to commute to an office in the city anymore. People want square footage. They want more of a yard where their kids can go play outside. And with an internet connection, I mean, you can be in business, right? I think this is for keeps. This is not going away. COVID has changed our way of life forever where this is concerned. And, you know, this is the life of an investor. There will be ups and there will be downs, but, you know, you can make an obscene amount of money just like I am doing just this one little niche. So today I'm just going to answer a few questions posted in the Facebook group. And I just don't see a ton of questions. Robert says, what do I do with the buried bodies on the property? <laughs> I would talk to the county about that. Um, that, you know, there are so many interesting, funny things that come up in our business. What happens if you don't sell the property when you file an affidavit? Hi, Jimmy. You know, each state, each county even has different rules for how long the affidavit um, will, the, the, uh, what is it, the, the term of how long it can be enforced. So you just need to check at your local level to find out about that. Um, let's see. This is skipping around on me. Hi, Terry Garrett. Um, oh, but Jimmy, I think what you're asking is what happens if you don't sell the property? I mean, you can release the affidavit. You can send a form to the county to release the affidavit or if, you know, if you're giving up on it. But if you don't sell it within the time frame, try to extend your agreement with the, with the seller so that you can continue to try to sell it. I hope that answers the question that you had. All right. I'm going to have to start at the bottom here. <laughs> Mulo Oscar said, how many mailers do you send? Currently, we're sending about 3,000 a week. Johanna asked, how do I find out if a state is a non-disclosure state? Uh, that's a great question. I would talk to people who are working in the state. I would also just try to Google it. Marty asks, what state am I in? I live in Nashville, Tennessee, but I invested in eight states last year, and I've, uh, I'm sending mail to 15 states this year. And no, Sylvia, you do not need to have a real estate license. I do have one, but it's mainly because I want to uh, be educated. It, to me, there's a lot of education that comes with having a license. And, um, but the number one thing I would just encourage you to do, no matter whether you get one or not, is just always disclose everything you know about what's going on with a property to someone who's thinking about buying it, okay? All right. Uh, Nicholas Lee says, what do you say when a seller asks you about the limited power of attorney to list on the MLS? Well, I let them know, Nicholas, that I'm an investor and that I'm looking at all the different ways that I might use the property to give it its highest and best use. One of those options might be marketing it for sale or just testing the market. So uh, that's usually how I handle it. All right, that's all I see right now. Listen, I help real estate investors achieve financial freedom with this plug and play A to Z blueprint for flipping land without funding your own deals. And it's in with this land flipping secrets program I've put together. I show investors the exact steps I've taken to find financial freedom and earn an average of $35,000 per deal. And I'm still accepting beta testers into my training. For more information, just go to landflipping101.com 
facebook.com forward slash course and if uh, you know if that interests you or if you have any specific questions about how I invest reach out to me post a question on the land flipping 101 Facebook page or send me a private message on Facebook or you can email Chris at land flipping 101.com I would love to hear about your journey into real estate investing all right have a good week and happy investing Oh, <laughs>